Okay, great. Good morning and good day and good afternoon, everybody. Uh, welcome to the general meeting for Probus Global, spring of 2023. I have a, we have a fairly aggressive agenda today, so we get right into it. But uh, first of all, I just want to make sure everybody's aware that this will be recorded. And if you have any uh, issues with uh, uh, you're being on the screen, please uh, block out your video as we get into uh, issues later on with the discussion and uh, particularly the Q&A. Um, the agenda today, uh, the welcome. Uh, I'll do a president's report, a brief report on where we are. Uh, Peter will uh, update uh, the information on the website and where we are as far as membership is concerned. Linda will uh, bring us up to speed on uh, the administration and the registration of clubs and members. Uh, Mary uh, will talk a little bit about the newsletter. And Gauthier will give us an update on Europe. Uh, then we'll talk about all the regions of, around the world and uh, Patrick as a late addition and a volunteer that he didn't know he's volunteering for. We'll talk a little bit about club information, but particularly the uh, Google op opportunities that we have. And keynote speaker for today is, is Nick French, and uh, we'll follow that up on Nick. We'll talk about South Africa and uh, the area, and then we'll have follow up, end it up with a general discussion and Q&A. Uh, for the President's report, um, membership status, uh, we continue to um, well, where, where'd to go here? Um, Continue to add members and, and countries, and Peter will uh, bring us up to speed on that a little later. Uh, newsletter, uh, we're now on a quarterly basis. Um, and of course, we continue expanding uh, distribution around the globe. And one of the things we like to encourage is if we can get uh, letters to the editor going. Revenue options, uh, We've discussed in previous meetings, um, our revenue stream today is zero. Uh, actually, there is a tab on the website. Uh, if you want to support Probus Global, you can send a contribution to Peter. Um, we are in discussion with a couple of different uh, companies in reference to maybe putting ads in uh, future editions of the newsletter. Marketing. Um, we're looking at options for the way we can promote uh, uh, Probus Global. Uh, one of the things we recently did, we did a PowerPoint presentation as the keynote speaker for a club in Ontario. Uh, very well accepted. And uh, that PowerPoint is available for anybody that would like to hear more about Probus Global. And also uh, you can contact uh, uh, people in your uh, from Probus Global in your area and ask them to do a presentation for you. Um, certainly, um, on the uh, website, we have a lot of information uh, when you go to club management, and uh, Patrick will talk a little bit about that later on, and I'm sure Peter will mention it also. Um, we're also looking and talking and discussing about how do we register uh, right now it's just a group of individuals that are members of uh, Probus Global. But at some point we have to, uh, in my opinion anyway, register it somewhere and we're looking at uh, some of the options maybe. Uh, and Gauthier gave a good presentation on that in the, at the last meeting. Uh, we have developed a number of Probus Global awards. Uh, the Shirley Roberts Memorial Award was presented earlier, uh, later last year. And uh, we're looking at uh, in the newsletter in the third quarter, we'll be requesting uh, nominations. And at that point, we'll, we'll put more specifications out on 
what the award is all about, but it's an award uh, that we created that would go max, be issued maximum once a year, and it will not be eligible for anybody on the management team of Probus Global. Also, we have an achievement award for uh, individuals that are doing great work for uh, Probus Global. And also we have an award that we created for uh, significant club anniversaries. So we've sent out a number of those over the years. And if you have requests for any of those, please uh, contact Linda on that. Uh, I mentioned the uh, promotion for Provost Global. Uh, that PowerPoint presentation is available and it's available. Just send a request through and we'll send it out to you. We continue to add programs uh, uh, and improve programs for uh, Provost Global. Now, speakers Corner, we continue to add speakers and Stan does a great job in qualifying. Well, uh, travel coordinator, we uh, see that uh, people are traveling around the world again and connecting with uh, Provost Global members around the world. Uh, photos by member, John Thorne did a great job in getting this going and it continues to add uh, photos from members. I mentioned the PG Award, Provost Global Awards. Provost Day is an ongoing uh, program, uh, October 1st. I uh, mentioned the quarterly uh, newspaper is uh, is to the point now where it is getting out every quarter, and we thank everybody who participates in that and sending articles in. The chat rooms are evolving and, and continuing to be updated, and we'd like to see more use, but we're getting there on that. Uh, the, the meeting you're attending today, once again, we try and do it at least three times to four times a, a year just to bring everybody up to speed on what's going on uh, with Probus Global. And Peter is going to talk uh, about uh, uh, the information you can get about members and uh, clubs around the world, particularly uh, the mapping of club who, and he will, I don't want to steal his thunder, but uh, it's been a great addition. So that's a, a brief overview of where we are from the president's standpoint. So if we move back to the agenda, uh, if Peter, um, uh, you want to take over and talk a little bit about the website, please? Sure. I'll share my screen here. <laughs> Dick, do you want to end your share? Has, has mine come up or is it still Dick's? Dick's still on there. <laughs> do you want to knock you off, Dick? Okay. Is, is mine up yet? Yeah, there you go. Okay, it's showing It's showing share. Boy, Dick mentioned the whole things I'm going to talk about that I didn't know I was going to talk about, so we'll, <laughs> we'll figure that out. <laughs> the The important parts of the uh, the website, uh, as I'm sure you all know, is if uh, you're a guest at today's meeting, uh, there's a button here to join, or if you uh, have a friend, uh, send them there and tell them to push this button. It says join Probus Global. Very simple application, and uh, you get approved pretty quickly if uh, Linda or I are around. Um, invite a friend if you've got somebody you would like to invite to join Probus Global. If you click this button and give us their email address, they'll get a personal email from uh, Richard that uh, he won't know about it because it's actually generated by computer. And the the most used part of the website is find a Probus Club. Uh, that's how how a lot of people find us. So they're they're googling looking for a club somewhere. And they end up coming to the uh, Provost Global site, and and as uh, Richard mentioned, there's uh, uh, maps and and search engines and different ways to find uh, clubs in different countries. And I, I won't really bother to go that too far into that. Um, frequently asked questions will take you to, among other things, uh, Richard mentioned the the slide presentation from the last meeting. Or no, from the meeting I guess he had in uh, in Newmarket was it? Anyway, you Richard gave a presentation about uh, Provost Global, and that PowerPoint is available for down download right there. But beside it are the statistics from uh, membership, and this is interesting because I made these uh, put updated these numbers last week. Uh, everybody loves my race here of uh, which, which country has the most uh, members. 
showing the growth uh, over the years, the uh, UK has been ahead uh, all the time. As you can see, 2020 is 128 to 56. Uh, but Canada has been uh, been catching up very quickly over the the last uh, couple of years, thanks to uh, Brenda and Marlene and their efforts. And last week, uh, when I when I updated it, when the newsletter went out, uh, the UK was ahead by two people. But uh, we've had four new members from Canada. <laughs> but so I updated it this morning, and we now stand at Canada 385 and Great Britain 383. So Patrick, uh, get going over there. Bravo! <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> and and as you can see, uh, the other countries uh, down the way, where uh, uh, as as uh, Gauthier said, there's five in the Netherlands, four in Germany, three in the U.S., two in Japan, one in Chile, one in Sweden. Oh. Uh, so mm -hmm. that that is the progress. Uh, this this graph shows the the growth over the last few years, and uh, the basically Probus Global grows uh, at a fairly steady rate. Uh, each time a newsletter comes out, there's a there's a bump in uh, in new members, and uh, I would expect that we're about to see one here as well. Uh, we, we have in the last week even. If we were a parliament, uh, as you can see, uh, back in 2019, uh, when there weren't so many members, but year by year, uh, the membership has grown. And uh, we finally end up at the uh, current situation where Canada has 385, Great Britain 383, Australia 91, South Africa 55, Ireland 36, and so on for a few members from a lot of other countries. So going back to uh, the website, very successful has been the uh, speaker's corner and uh, Stan is on the uh, on the Zoom this morning and he has done a great job of curating our uh, our speakers. These are people that, that have spoken at other Probus clubs, have been recommended or uh, have come in from other venues, but they've always been people who are, are willing and able to speak at Probus clubs locally if they happen to be anywhere near. But by Zoom, if uh, if you're wishing to have a Zoom speaker, and uh, Chris Leeworthy claims that he has had thirty, uh, he's given thirty talks as a result of uh, the speakers' corner that's introduced him to a number of Probus clubs around the world, and he he's very good, uh, very busy uh, in November around uh, Remembrance Day, uh, and we had him for our local club here in St. Catharines as well. But uh, at this point, as you can see, there's just a long list of speakers. There are. There are 36 speakers listed, and there are actually eight more in the hopper, uh, just finishing up their, their card, which is uh, what the presentation shows. And there are about 88 uh, different talks that are available uh, on, on that site. So a good place to find speakers for your club if you're uh, looking for somebody. Uh, that was all I intended to go through. Uh, the photos, as, uh, as uh, Richard also mentioned, is uh, quite popular and uh, we're getting photographs. Patrick just put one in from uh, London from his trip. And uh, I, I happened to be at the end of the Sydney to Hobart race and, and I put some pictures in from Tasmania. Uh, Merv was on his trip around New Zealand. So uh, uh, people are, are posting some, some excellent photographs and it's, uh, it's very interesting to, uh, to look at. And there's a discussion group on groups.io for people to, uh, to talk about the pictures and sometimes talk about photography and sometimes just talk about travel. Uh, are, are there any questions about, about this area? And otherwise, I think we can move on. Do we have to send you the picture? The, you go to the photo <laughs> page and you can uh, just drop the file or or paste it, copy and paste the image. That's that's all you need to do to put it on the photos page. Easy. It's very easy. Even Patrick can do it. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> I, you. You know, Peter, I was about to say thanks very much for all you do with us, but I'm taking that back. <laughs> ah, that's great. Right. All right. Well, I'll stop sharing so that uh, Richard can move us on to the next one. Okay. Thank you very much, Peter. And uh, I was going to say to Patrick until he uh, made those comments. Uh, to, yes, uh, I've even put them on, and I'm the probably the most technical challenge of the group here. So it is somewhat uh, easy and uh, straightforward to, to add your photos. Thank you, Peter. And now moving on, uh, Linda, uh, you want to bring us up to speed on registration and your little area? 
You're muted, Linda. You're muted. <laughs> Linda, you're up. Oh, Sorry you. about that. I was looking at my uh, report and forgot I was muted. Um, <laughs> basically, every day I get uh, oh many emails, maybe some days four, but others much more. <laughs> Um, where I get information that comes to me, thanks to Peter, on each club and when it was last updated. And I still have some that were 1970, um, many from 2019. And if there's an email, which I really hope there is, I will send um, an email to them and say, and show what information we have on the club and ask if they wouldn't mind replying with um, more current um, information, which many do. And then I go and update our website on their particular club with more current information. If it's just a phone number, then I do a search, you know, Google, or I go to some of the uh, websites like that are available with France and Ireland, South Pacific, Netherlands, Germany, and, and places like that and see if there's anything there that might be more current. Um, and sometimes there are. But it's just a phone number, so I can't really send an email. And if I send an email, I do encourage them to join Probus Global, which happens many times. Um, I have been getting also clubs that say, unfortunately, uh, we've had to close down due to um, members membership declining. Um, but others are actually joining uh, other Probus clubs together so that they're, um, you know, staying alive, so to speak. Um, I also, many men clubs are turning to mix. They're uh, uh, inviting the ladies along. Um, and I can't really think of much more to say other than um, I, I have pointed out, if you don't mind me doing so, I don't mean to upset anyone, but um, uh, go to the Belgium uh, website. I really can't use that for finding any clubs because there's nothing listed or anything. And there's yep. pretty well, they just have to go to you. But then I'm sure you're right on it. If somebody sends you an email, you respond and, and help out the person that's um, perhaps visiting uh, Belgium and would like to know if there's a Probus club there or somebody newly um, located there that wants to join a club. So it's just on an ongoing basis and uh, bit by bit by bit, uh, we're updating the uh, club information for people that are traveling around the world. And I guess that's it. I don't know if you have any questions, but that's it for me. <laughs> Thank you, Linda. Uh, if anybody has any, any comments? Uh, okay. Well, I'll, I'll be happy to comment when, when I talk about Belgium. Okay, great. Thank you. Uh, I, I guess the question I have is uh, in Japan, uh, we, we know there is probably, I think there's about 2,500 clubs. Uh, is there a method where we could send information to those clubs about Probus Global? Kanishi. <laughs> Pardon? Pardon? About me, about Japan, you... Yeah, I'm wondering if there's a way that we could uh, send more information, uh, maybe our newsletter to the clubs in Japan. Oh, uh, uh, newsletter. Uh, I reported about my report. Okay, very good. Thank you. Uh, then we'll move on to Mary and the newsletter. Mary, you're muted. Hello, Puss. Keeping my dog awake. <laughs> um, we ended up with 11 pages. The last issue. Can you hear me? Yes, we can, Mary. Thank you. We in the 11 pages in the last issue. Um, as I said, you know, I've got a couple of little articles in there that are not probus related, that are kind of fillers, and I've got plenty of those to put in if you want more pages, but I, I need guidance whether you actually want more of those. 
um, we've been talking about advertising and my concern is that, for example, we have PSPL, Provost South Pacific Limited, in Australia and New Zealand, and they're looking for advertisers as well, as are the individual states in Australia which have their own magazines. So if we do advertise in our newsletter, I'm concerned that we hit the mark as far as um, how much we actually are going to charge for that. And that's that's for another conversation, obviously, but it's it's something we have to keep in mind. And the other thing that I was wondering, now last time um, we had this meeting, the newsletter came out, oh, three months later. If we could move this to three weeks earlier, then we could include it and have it fresh as a, as a um, report of a meeting that happened, quote, last week, unquote. So it's just something else to think about. Um, that's about all I have to say. I, I should just, just for the statistics part, uh, the newsletter was sent to 1163 people or something of that, that night nature, uh, about a hundred subscribers who are not members who have signed up to subscribe to the newsletter and the, uh, and the members, uh, minus those whose emails have been bouncing. So we don't bother to keep sending to, to bounced emails. And of those people, 73% opened up the, uh, the email and looked at it, which is a pretty good uh, rate for a newsletter like that. It is. Those two, could we charge, instead of advertising, those people who are not members but subscribe to it, is there any way we can perhaps in, raise in some fact, money? That, that is currently set up. Um, people probably noticed that when they got their newsletter, there's an option there to be a, a supporter or paid subscriber. And uh, the, the way it's set up is uh, with, with Substack, you can have a newsletter for, that's free and additional parts that are not free for people who, who want to subscribe. So it's, a, it's an option or the newsletter can go out earlier to people who've paid. It's a way to, to raise money. But at this point, we haven't seen a whole lot of people wanting to make donations in any way. So, uh, but that's something we need to, to talk about. Uh, I, uh, another question on the newsletter, uh, we have seen comments from different areas about uh, having a translation. I, I guess, is that, a, is that a possibility that if we issued the, the newsletter earlier to specific, uh, you know, specific people and they then in turn can get it uh, translated? Well, I, I put that article, that Dutch article through Google Translation and it was beautiful. I really only had to tweak it a little bit so it'll appear in the next newsletter as it was spoken in Dutch. Logistics wise is, you know, we send it out PDF now. Do we have to send it out to the people that would be interested in translation in a, another doc type of document? If, uh, <laughs> If I may come in, uh, well, the Dutch and English article that I sent to Mary, uh, if it is for Belgium, I would not translate. Uh, there's no need to translate to Dutch or translate to French as far as I'm concerned. Uh, so the English version is perfect. Okay. Uh, so uh, the, on the only idea I had was uh, to include uh, some, some of the Dutch, but with a minimal translation in English included for those who don't understand Dutch and French. Well, it makes it too long if we have both yeah, okay, the I agree. article too, if we have it both in Dutch and English. Yeah. So I have translated the lot to English um, and it's come up very well. It, it would be difficult that right. to, to put the Dutch. Because I was going to offer to do that for you. Well, Dr. Google did it for me. 
<laughs> well, that's not always too good. We we can always link the all, we can link the right. original. We could link the original Dutch version on the website and just put a link in the newsletter that says if you want to read the original Dutch version, here it is. I am. Well, we can do that. Yes. Yeah. <clears throat> we could do the same for Japan. We could do the same for. Uh, yeah, we're, we're trying to with Goche and Jafir uh, mm -hmm. working on this, trying to get into Germany. So that may be yeah. a way to really start the ball rolling there. Excellent. Okay, I'll, uh, yeah. let, let let us consider it. Okay, and, and we'll we'll find out. Uh, in practice, way to do it, yes. but if Peter puts the Dutch version with the next uh, the, in the next issue on on the web, um, yeah. I'll just put a link in okay. in the newsletter down the bottom. If you want to see the Dutch to see this article in, you know, then here's your link. And P Peter, can you then register? How many people would uh, would link to that? Yeah, I can look at that. Because if if nobody looks at the at the link, uh, yeah, then it's you. It, you don't. <laughs> we don't have to do it. Eh? Sure. Yeah. Let's let's try that with the next newsletter. We'll 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 just offer that as a, a possibility. To see how many people do it. Okay. Great. All right. Okay. Uh, Moving on, uh, Goche, an update from your and uh, report from the, our last general meeting. You talked about Europe, and I know you have an update, so thank you for doing okay. it. Okay. I suppose Peter will put it on. No, I don't. I... <laughs> uh, uh, <laughs> Linda, do you have uh, Goche's? Uh, PowerPoint. Well, it was distributed. L Linda had the reports. Yeah. 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 Peter, I, I sent the PDF in the reports. I didn't send the PowerPoint. No, I, I haven't seen them. So the, the question, I think Gautier was hoping that you could put up his PowerPoint. Can you do that? Yeah. So next time I should uh, send one uh, one to you, Peter. No, you 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 can share your own screen. It's much easier to do your own. Well, I'm not I'm not used to do that. I'm not. Ah. I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> we'll do a training session. You yeah. have, have it, Linda. Can you can you access his PowerPoint quickly? I I I think I've just said. I think I've only got the report. Sorry, Peter. And sorry, Gothi. I just take it and create a PDF, right? Next time, I'll send it to Peter immediately. So I apologize. Okay. Well, okay. Uh, I'll find it and I'll send it. Uh, I think I can find it here and I'll send it to uh, Steve, can you, uh, once I send it to you, can you pick it up? In the meantime, why don't we move to Patrick and Patrick, if you can, uh, Patrick and a couple of our members are going back and forth uh, on a uh, part of the club administration and, uh, and tracking information, that type of thing. And we had actually, Patrick had put something on the on our website many uh, months ago, and this conversation started. I thought it'd be great if Patrick, if you take a few minutes to update where we are on the Google system. Uh, I certainly can do that. What I've also got here, Roger, is I've got the PDF that was sent out. So I could just share that uh, oh. Gautier slides, I think. So give me one sec and let me see whether uh, Great. Whoops. hopefully you go to you can see the the slides. Let me know when you want me to go to the next one. Okay. Uh, well, I'm I'm uh, I'm available to start on on on, you, on Europe. Go ahead, Gautier. Okay, no. Well, it, 
uh, it's as, as so everybody should know that uh, it is a common work of uh, Jacques Pierre Nollet in France and myself of uh, Belgium. And if we can move to the next slide, uh, it's all of all of Europe, the colored parts, uh, ex except for what we consider uh, Great Britain, uh, because of the Brexit. Uh, it's no longer part of the of the European connections we are trying to look for. Uh, and then I'll pass on uh, the word to Jacques Pierre because uh, on Probus France. We yes, we had our yearly general meeting on January the twelfth, and we had the election of a new president, Bertrand Le Bidois which is brand new because it's coming from south of France, despite the concentrations of clubs in north of France. So with that guy, a new management team has been elected. And we were very glad to receive a province Belgium, which will come each time when we have a general annual meeting. So now we are 66 clubs and five clubs in preparation. So move to the next one, Gautier. Okay. Well, uh, I, I was the person who was invited in, uh, in France and our national president uh, was, had, the, had the last minute uh, call off uh, to, to be present too in, uh, in France. So as far as uh, the management team uh, for Belgium, there's no change in 2023. So it is the same president. And linking back to the question of Linda, uh, she had the, she raised the problem of contacting Belgium clubs. So indeed, on the website, we only offer a general email address mm -hmm. that reaches both the president and the national secretary, okay. and they redirect to specific clubs. Okay. I can easily add to that, Linda, if uh, you have a specific question or so, you can easily contact me as well. The, the only problem is, Gauthier, is that we can't update our list on the website, our PG website. We don't have any information for Belgium clubs at all. So we have to direct them to your website. And I guess that's the process. Well, that's is, the way it is. If, if, if uh, are, are you... Familiar with the list of uh, Probus clubs? In Belgium? Yeah. I don't, I can't see it. Like, I don't I can. Have... I can, well, I, I have in the past, but I can easily send you a list of the current Belgian Probus clubs. Would be great. Thank you very much. Okay, I'll, I'll do that. I'll do that. Okay. Uh, at least that's, that's... Uh, an intermediate uh, to what you're expecting. Okay, thank you. Uh, as far as membership in, in Belgium, it is approximately a, a status quo, uh, but we're down from uh, before COVID. And uh, luckily, uh, but uh, not in all regions, we are preparing for at least two new clubs to be chartered uh, in the course of 2023. Uh, we will lose more clubs in the coming years, probably not the first two or three years, but uh, there are several clubs that have an average age late in the 80s and dwindling number of members uh, and not being able to catch up with new members. And what, what made uh, quite a number of people aware of Probus Global was the visit of Don Ross uh, from uh, Winnipeg in Canada, uh, who through his daughter who lives in Antwerp, uh, joined a local meeting of uh, Antwerp North in December. And that was very well received in that club. It, contrary to some, some reactions I've heard uh, this afternoon, it didn't lead to new memberships uh, of Provis Global, but I'll try to catch up on that. 
And if we go to other countries and uh, and and uh, Probus Holland, uh, they have just elected a new president, and uh, both Jacques Pierre Nollet and myself uh, have contacted uh, the the new management. Uh, we don't know all all the persons yet in the new management team, but we are going to Holland uh, next week uh, in order to set uh, to set up contact. First of all, between France, Belgium, and Holland, but secondly, to also to promote Probus Global and present what uh, what it means. So this is, as far as I'm concerned, uh, a very positive. Uh, way of going on we have we have had both countries uh, france and belgium have had long term contacts with uh, the dutch the french have been uh, setting up a probus club in 2018 in uh, finland as there was uh, a relationship a, a French person linking to uh, or getting married to a Finnish lady or, or vice versa, I think. I don't know. Uh, but uh, certainly there, there, a, a Probus club was founded there. And through the contact uh, that I received from Linda, uh, we were aware of a Probus club in Sweden to join Probus Global. And we have contacted them, and we hope that this will bring more contacts uh, between ourselves and uh, the Swedish club. Uh, they don't have a website either, uh, so we'll try to get more information from other Provost clubs in Sweden. Uh, I know for sure that there's one in Göteborg, uh, but how many there are in total in Sweden, I don't know. And then we can move to Germany. Uh, same thing, there was a question to Probus Global raised of how, how where they could uh, get supplies of pins and other uh, things which they used to get in Britain. But because of the, uh, the Brexit, it is more and more difficult administratively to get shipments from England to the continent. Yeah. So uh, because that question raised, we could offer uh, to provide either from France, from Holland, from Belgium, uh, what the Karst Probus Club was looking for. So I've had already quite a bit of conversation, uh, email conversation with them. And uh, okay, they, they are a mixed club and they meet twice a month, but it also raises the question, there's 12 clubs, only 12 clubs in Germany. They don't have many contacts amongst themselves and they're, they're, they have a tendency to age and not catch enough young uh, people to join them. So our objective of uh, Jacques Pierre Nollet and myself is to contact all 12 uh, in the due course of this year. And try to visit the guy from CAST with whom uh, yeah. contact. Uh, it, it, it is possibly on the way of, of a, a trip to friends of mine, for instance, and that could be a, an opportunity to visit them. So I've already mentioned the joint uh, efforts uh, between France, Belgium and Holland uh, next week. Um, and we are inviting uh, both uh, a delegation from both countries to the 25th National Day in Belgium and also to um, a golfing uh, event that takes place annually in, uh, in September. And uh, between France and Belgium, more, much more than between Holland and Belgium, there is exchanges of visits from uh, individual clubs to another club. That is it for uh, as far as, uh, as we are. Uh, if there are any questions on that, please feel free to uh, raise them.
Thank you, Gauthier. Uh, I should mention that one of the clubs in France, I don't have it in front of me, uh, invited us to be their keynote speaker in January of the ah, four. So I, I think I may have sent you the, the uh, initial email and the correspondence. If not, I'll resend it. But they've asked us to be participate in, in their in their meeting in January. That's good. Year. Yeah, that's in Lyon. Correct. I, I saw the, some the request. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I, I we copied you on that. Uh, from around the world, anybody else have any comments about what's happening in their part of the world? Uh, Graham, uh, maybe you can fill us in a little bit on. Uh, the UK, Britain, and uh, your efforts with Stan to uh, set up a communication chain in Scotland. Yeah, good afternoon, everyone. Um, <clears throat> I I wish I had the same sort of uh, setup as got here there. Uh, it would be a lot more encouraging than it is. <laughs> uh, I've had very constructive meetings with Stan. I've shared a lot of information with him, a lot of ideas. So we're at where we are at present, I have made uh, some good contacts with various Probus clubs around here uh, to the extent where we're starting to share meetings and so on. And I've visited one or two around about. Uh, <laughs> it's quite interesting because I, I, I tell everybody that I'm, of course, the president of the local club, but also global, uh, Prober's global representative and, the rec and I'm there to audit them and I'm a spy in the camp and all sorts of stuff. So it's quite, <laughs> quite good. Um, but I have managed with a couple of clubs, not many, to promote the concept of Prober's global. And every time that I um, try and email uh, clubs, I do put in the presentation that was that was available. Unfortunately, I have to report that the, re the response, certainly in this neck of the woods, is grim. I don't know what the problem is. Maybe it's a culture thing. I just don't know. But they are so insular and, you know, so parochial up here that just beggars belief. I did get some really good um, feedback from that daft newsletter that we or that thing that I do. Uh, I had a great contact there with Paul Jackson. He got in touch and sent a couple of newsletters from his club, which are really, really interesting, first class. And I also got a lovely communication from Barry Morgan. So in that respect, we are trying to get out there. I also was very privileged to welcome a couple of folk from Australia to our Probus uh, Christmas lunch, our local one, uh, from Warunga Pro Probus. And my intention is to try and twin with that club, twin our club with them. But it's just a matter of getting down to it. Now, Stan has given me an immense amount of information, clubs and so on and so on. So it's just a matter of us trying to, or me or whatever, trying to sift through all this and come up with some sort of strategy. Problem is tracking these clubs down because a lot of them have gone to the wall. Uh, a lot of them are not interested. Um, we have contacted uh, one or two, and I think out of about 12, only one responded, and that's just in the local area here. Now, whether they're defunct or whatever, I just would not know, but only one responded, and it was pretty wishy-washy. But we'll keep on trying. I, I would love to try and get some sort of directory of the clubs UK-wide. Uh, Historically, it has been in place, but it just seems to have fallen apart. Stan, have you anything you'd like to add? Well, uh, Graham, uh, it, it sounds quite a bit like several reactions of clubs in Belgium. If uh, if I talk to uh, about twinning even within Belgium uh, or with France or Holland, uh, there's there's a, a, a vague reaction, and 
the, my understanding is behind that is well we're happy amongst ourselves in our little club yeah and don't well, bother us too much uh, yeah. it and it becomes very what, parochial and very insular yeah sometimes it's then oh well but if we have french people then we we have to say everything in two languages uh, Others don't mention that. Then it is, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, it doesn't fit into our program. Uh, but you have so, certain clubs that are basically opening the arms and and uh, doing an effort. I, I'm trying very hard to get, uh, my, well, certainly my lot to endorse the the dual gender club. I think it's imperative that we do that, but. As a sort of reactionary old guard that says, "Oh no, no, no!" Well, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's uh, and, and I oh, find that just totally unacceptable. Uh, the, I have the, been very privileged, especially with Stan's club, where we have where he is the dual membership, which I think is brilliant. Uh, the, I went to uh, visited a club in Aberdeen, quite a select group actually. Um, all the members are either ex. <laughs> Um, lecturers at Aberdeen University or they're all professors and all sorts of stuff yeah. and I've got to try and find out what the collective noun is for a, a bunch of professors uh, but I, I haven't found it as yet um, so but these guys were exclusively uh, male and would never endorse Not very good, lovely club very welcome, all the rest of it but you know a bit stuffy. Yeah. yeah. But Graham, next time you come on the continent, give us a call. We'll be glad to meet you. With Gautier. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Oh, uh, Doug here uh, from uh, near Niagara Falls, Canada. Uh, a quick question. Is anyone here from Australia? If so, um, you know if the club from Adelaide is still going? I was there in 2019. I visited that club, heard an excellent speaker speak about the Charles Worth that Company. Um, so if anyone could answer that question, just curious if the Phobos Club at Adelaide is still going. I can find out for you. Thank you. That, that's Mary, our newsletter lady. Thank Mary you, Mary. Wilson. The Phobos Club of Adelaide. Adelaide, yes, in Australia. Adelaide. Um, yeah, I'll find out for you while we're talking. Okay. Uh, anybody else have any comments from uh, their area? Barry, yes. Barry Morgan? Can I pick up on what uh, Graham was saying just before? Oh, by the way, hello, Graham. Nice to have emailed with you last last week. We had a good chat. Um, hello, your lordship. In Canada, we have 248 clubs, majority in Ontario, but um, barely half of those clubs have a website. They seem to think it's uh, space science, but it's not really. And what really concerns me is not having a website. I don't know how to get it. Because many of them don't update their details on the Probus Canada website and then of the ones that do have a website about half of them have them protected with the password so I can't get in have a look at their newsletter find out who to speak to and pick up ideas about guest speakers and key things that they do I don't understand why they're so secretive about what they're doing it's very frustrating Barry can I answer that for you yes Brenda thank you I go on to the uh, probuscanada.ca all the clubs are listed there everything should be up to date the directors have to put in the uh, new um <clears throat> excuse me the new presidents and secretaries everything should be there if it's not Barry contact me and I will help you, okay? Yes, Brenda, I take your point. I'm in touch with one of them and I've been trying to get a Zoom with the one's immediate me, like, local area and set up a little small group. Okay, with... I, I, I do that with my district, Barry. So if you would like 
I will talk to you after the meeting. Yeah, this is the Scarborough Group. And yeah, I understand. Guild, my daughter lives down the Guild. And I've offered to help them to set up a basic web page with the basic information on and, and how to get into the Probus Canada website to update their details. Well, your district director, Bill Wilson, should be doing that for you. You should contact him. Yes, and well, if you don't have a, and if you can't get through to him, then call me. Well, Bill is trying to get a district meeting going, you know, with the new reorganization of the districts within Canada. So um, I'm hoping that Bill is going to have a district meeting in April next month. My words, next month, <laughs> April. But anyway. Well, that's, well, that's good to hear that. <clears throat> that'll be fantastic where everybody okay. can get together and share ideas. But well, that's, that's what I do with my district, uh, Barry. But yes. I'll, I can talk to you after the meeting, if you like. That's great, Brenda. Okay, okay. great. Thank you. Okay. About the, about the Adelaide clubs, the, the one in the CBD is still going. Yes, definitely. Um, and there's an Adelaide North Club as well. And that one I'm not sure about. They don't have a website, so I would have to call them. Oh, okay. That was uh, on the Adelaide Club. Who who was it that was looking for that information? Uh, Douglas, was it? It was Doug. Uh, thank you. I, I'm sorry. I, I had to step away for a second. Uh, so I missed Mary's comments. Uh, so thanks for that follow-up, Mary. Uh, what I said was there are two Adelaide clubs. One is Adelaide CDB and CBD, <coughs> and, and the other one is Adelaide North. Well, the CBD one is definitely still going because I went into their <laughs> websites and they have programs going this year. And the Adelaide North one, I have no idea because they don't have a website. Uh, okay, well, thank you. And I'll follow up with my friend that I attended with to see which club that was in Adelaide. Thanks again, Mary. That's okay. all right. Okay, I just want to mention about Canada. Uh, Peter showed the horse race where uh, the Canadian membership has overtaken the uh, UK as far as the number of PG members. A lot of that uh, should go to uh, Marlene and Brenda. Uh, they're doing their outstanding job in promoting uh, Provost Global within Canada. Uh, Marlene has a numerous uh, meetings and presentations she's made uh, at in many clubs and Brenda in her role as president of Provost Canada, every time she has a meeting, uh, she takes an opportunity to promote Provost Global. So uh, really hats off to those two ladies. Uh, we're getting a little uh, pushed on time. So maybe unless there's anybody else, any comments from a regional standpoint, uh, we can move on to uh, Patrick. And Richard, Patrick, uh, sorry, you've, okay. you've got a question from Paul D. Paul. Hi. <clears throat> Hello, this is my first time I've joined you guys. Um, I just wanted to refer to the issue about women. We are in, I am living in the Cotswolds, Oxfordshire, just outside Oxford. And we have had a five-year battle inside the club to accept women. <laughs> And eventually, um, it went through a year ago now. Frankly, it was a condition of me being chairman that that would be the case. And 90% uh, voted. The trick that we met, all missed for five years when we were arguing about it was that we were able to welcome back widows. That widows were part of the, the club. They were on social events, it's quite an active club. Um, and then suddenly the husband dies, the member dies, and we say to the women, bugger off, you know. Um, and I think if we'd have made that point earlier in our deliberations, um, it would have gone through much quicker. And in fact, we have now in 12, in, in 12 months, we've doubled our membership, but we have um, 12, maybe 13 women have joined us. Four of them are widows, so it's not just widows, as it were. 
I just wanted to make that point. If you're trying to persuade your club, uh, that that was something we missed completely as we argued about it at every AGM. And uh, just say hello to you, all you guys. Thank you, Paul. Uh, I'll mention about Canada. Maybe Brenda can update the statistics. But uh, uh, previously, a uh, number of years ago, probably five, six years ago in Canada, there were uh, 40 uh, women's clubs and 40 men's club and about 160 combined clubs. So, and most new clubs in Canada have been combined. So, uh, you know, clubs around the world are, are, are open to, uh, you know, to the, to the uh, champions of the club. And, uh, it's their decision how they want to form a club. But as I said, mostly in Canada recently, it's been uh, uh, combined club. Lynn and Pickering, you had a comment? Um, yes, our club actually has more women than men. And I think that's very common in a lot of the ones in Canada. And we also have a lot of women that are single and widowed that I've talked to in the last few years. And now you see them grouping together and traveling together. And it's wonderful to see what they've gotten out of the club. So I hats out to all those women that join, that's all. Yeah. Good. Any other comments or? Yeah, I've got my question, my hand up here. Okay. Can you hear me? We can hear you, yes. Yes, I'm Debbie. I'm with the Probus Club of Prince Edward County in Ontario, Canada. And it was our club that Richard um, came and spoke to uh, about Probus Global. It was really well received. Just, uh, this is really great. First time I've come to one of these meetings. I joined Probus Global as a result of that presentation that was made. So thank you for that, Richard. But I just did want to make one comment, and this might be partly a cultural thing. Tomorrow is International Women's Day, and it's Women's Day, not Ladies' Day. And I'm just kind of surprised to see so much Probus Global and other Probus material that is uh, referring to um, women as ladies. Um, it's, it's men and women. And I, I just think that might be a helpful way for um, recruitment of younger retirees um, because I think the language matters. Just a, just a thing that I, I thought I would share because it, um, it really does uh, come home to me often when I'm looking at the materials. And I couldn't find that race on the website. I went to look. I guess I have to, maybe I have to log in to find the race. No, the, it, you, you can find it in the FAQ uh, and it's open to anyone. Okay, I'll look again. Thank you. I, I wonder if, if one of the British uh, participants would want to comment on the women versus ladies uh, nomenclature because I think the terminology is different in Britain than it is in Canada. Well, as a, as a token Scot in the southeast of England, um, I'm probably... <laughs> able to to do that i don't think in the uk we would people would feel any differently between the the use of the term ladies or women um so i don't think it would make a difference here yeah i, uh, I just noticed that the official names of the clubs in in the uk are almost always ladies not yeah. women yeah right. that's yeah, the that's, way it first started right. That's the way it first started. Eddie, I think, I think I this is a this could be a very long discussion, Richard, and I think we are yeah. already half an hour behind the <laughs> agenda. It, so. should be, it should be like a women. But we should talk about it. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> uh, Patrick, you're going to give a quick summary of uh, <laughs> recent uh, going back and forth about uh, club administration, tracking information, and that comes back to Google. Okay, thank, thank you for the, the gentle hint that it would be a, a quick explanation. Uh, and to be honest, I don't think that there's any great point in me going into any sort of de great detail because some of you will know about these things, some of you won't know and won't care about it. So what I thought I'd just give is a very quick background and then a couple of links to things. So uh, just Two bits of background. The, the first was that way back in 2006, um, I started to use a product called uh, Google Calendar. 
And as a result of that, started to use the other Google products. So Gmail, Google Docs, Google Sheets, et cetera, et cetera. Um, works really well for me. So that was great. Fast forward 10 years and I retired in 2016 and I started to teach people how to use computers. And a friend said to me, please, Patrick, go and see my father because I cannot stand going there because he's so inept with his computer. So I went up to see Colin, um, who was the secretary of a local Probus club. And there was something on his desk and I said to him, Colin, what's this Probus thing that's all over here? And he said, Probus, you need to come along, come along as my guest next time. So I came along, joined Probus, and I think it was on my second uh, lunch there. I watched the, the social secretary, I think it was, uh, or it might have been the vice president who was trying to organize something. And he, he ended up handing out about sort of 45 pieces of paper, one to each of the people that was there and had a note of who wasn't there so he could pass the piece of paper on to them. For, it was all about some event or other and people had to fill it in and return it to him. And then he would manually collate all of the responses. And I said to Colin afterwards, I said, Colin, I think you could do an awful lot better with, with this. You could make your lives a lot easier by using technology, which already exists. And he sort of hummed and hawed and he said, mm, OK, come along to the next um, committee meeting. So I went along to the next committee meeting and I spoke to the committee and I said, well, I think you could have your own website because we didn't have a website. I think you could be using various other Google tools like Google Calendar or Forms and Sheets and Docs and things. And so Charles, who was the president at that point at the end of my talk said, yep, yeah, I think that all sounds really interesting. Thank you, Patrick. And I think it's great that you're joining the committee. And I thought, <laughs> I, did I mention committee at, at any point? So I got volunteered to join the committee and I thought, well, they, they only meet two or three times a year or three or four times a year, that's okay. Um, but because I'd been given a job title, apparently that means that every month I have to stand up and say what's been happening in my part of Probus. So um, that's what kind of got me into helping our, my local Probus group. Uh, initially, there were two aspects to it. There was a website, um, because we wanted to make sure that people could find us. Uh, we've been hearing all about these issues about where's my local Probus group. Um, and we uh, set up mailing lists. So just one place where we could add everybody's names and then that information was available to anybody in the committee to send out emails. Uh, up to then, each member of the committee had had their own list of members and of course that only guarantees that it's going to be wrong not everybody will update things correctly so we've now got three lists which are available where there is one just for the committee one which includes all the members and one which is used for our trips which is organized by somebody else in the club and that just works really well people don't need to remember uh, to update their own lists. It's just something that I update when people join or remove if they if they leave. Um, so we use lots of products. We use um, things like Google Forms for those that know it. It's um, an electronic way of filling out a form and that information then gets added into a spreadsheet. So when we have our, our dinners, we have two per year, um, it's able to monitor who's coming, uh, who are they bringing, what are they wanting to eat, um, and any other requirements that they might have or who they'd like to sit with, etc. And that apparently has just made a massive change to what the vice president needs to do. So uh, that all seems to be going very well. Um, for those that are wondering, well, why is this happened why have I been asked today to do it? 
This was all prompted by something on Peter's wonderful website where he has a sort of uh, area, what's it called? Uh, well, the, the messages group within uh, within the here. Um, if I just share that one, you'll, you'll see that this was all started by Addy asking a question uh, if anybody else was using any Google products. So uh, I then went back to say, this is how we're using Google products. Um, and so that sort of carried on with lots of toing and froing and lots more questions, etc. So if you've if you've not seen it, uh, I'll, after I've finished, I'll put a couple of links into the chat window just in case anybody wants to find those. Um, as part of that, um, Peter had also kindly put a link into something that I'd written before, which will be, I'm sure, impossible to read. So if I just make it a bit bigger, um, this is the sort of things that we've been using in our club. And so there's a list of things in there. I should probably update it, Peter. So uh, I might try and do so. And the other thing, which I think is it's quite an interesting thing with the link to Probus Global, I think, is that um, we have our website and I can check analytics to see how many people are visiting our website. Um, and we've got our AGM coming up in April. So I was doing my usual, what will I say in my report for the AGM? And so as usual, I thought I'll put in a link which shows how many people are visiting. So this, if you're able to at least get some idea of the fact that this is a map and anything that isn't blue is a country which has not visited our website in uh, the year January to December 2022. Now, I'm absolutely certain that people wouldn't have found this if it wasn't for uh, Probus Global um, so I am quite delighted about the fact that lots of people around the world have been visiting us and seeing what our little club does. On that note, I will probably just stop. I'll stick in a couple of uh, links, but if anybody wants to know more about things, then once you've had a look at the, the links that I send through, just send me an email and I'll try and help wherever I can. Thank you, Patrick. Would you like, would you like to write a little article about how to make running your club easier? Well, I, I would say, Mary, I probably already have because uh, I suspect that, that that article that Peter um, put onto the, the website perhaps does that, unless you need it in a cut down format. Yes. I think Stan has his hand up. We... Stan, you had the comment? Or maybe he accidentally raised his hand. <laughs> Maybe he just, wanted to go to the washroom. <laughs> I was just, I was just, I'm just scratching my head, actually. <laughs> that, that's encouraging. Stan has stayed awake for the whole thing so far. <laughs> yeah. I can't okay. compete with everybody. Patrick, yeah, Patrick, is what you showed us available on the global website? Yes. Oh, great. Thank you. It's, uh, I want to take a look at it. It's all on the uh, club management page, Russ. Thanks, Peter. Okay, keep trying to keep to our schedule, which is 15 minutes over. Uh, uh, we'll move on to Nick, our keynote speaker. And uh, Nick is going to talk a little bit about his area today. Yeah, we always have a focus area, and today it's South Africa. Uh, Nick has been a member of our Pro as well for many years. Uh, also, he is on our um, speaker's corner and he's given our club a number of uh, talks. So 
Uh, so without further ado, let's uh, move on to Nick. Fine, thank you, Richard, and uh, good day to everyone, wherever you may be in the world. Uh, it's a great honor to be here to present to you, and uh, a special welcome to my two fellow compatriots who are online, Leo Kirk and Belvin, Bevan Calvert, both from Durban. So welcome, guys. Good to have your support. Thank you. <laughs> All right, so um, I'm going to share my screen and give you a whistle-stop tour of what um, ha has been happening in South Africa. And I hope everybody can see this. Um, let me just enlarge yeah. my screen. Okay. There we go. Uh, so hopefully you can all see that. So the title of my talk is going to be South Africa, the reality. Why the reality? Well, it's quite simple. You know, whenever you travel to a country on, as a tourist, you, know, you you're just really exposed to the very tip of the iceberg. Uh, and you think, wow, this is a fantastic place and, and you know, really great. But it's, it's only when you live there for an extended period of time that you, you're exposed to the realities and sometimes the not so nice situations. And I'm, I'm sorry to say at the moment, there seems to be a lot more not so nice situations than nice situations. And I'm going to share this with you and how they came about and how this has impacted on Probus so in South Africa. So you're going to get a little bit of um, of, of a review, country review at the end. Now, if you look at the heading there, it says Southern Africa. Why Southern Africa? Because a couple of decades ago, Probus in, in Africa used to comprise Zimbabwe, South Africa, and possibly some other countries as well. But over time, Zimbabwe's basically frittered away to what we understand as nothing. I mean, there could be Probus clubs active there, but we just simply don't know about them or how to get in touch with them. But I want to give you an overview of Zimbabwe, what happened there, and possibly why it led to the demise of demise, sorry, of, of various uh, clubs in there. So why history? Now, when I was at secondary school, we spent a lot of time studying English history, Egyptian history, and it was all boring. And we, we used to ask our teacher, why do we have to worry about history? And he said, to understand, and I say to predict the future, you need to know the past. So I'm going to share with you a lot of the history about Zimbabwe and South Africa and demonstrate to you how this is in, in fact impacting on Probus in both these regions. So let's just start quickly with Zimbabwe. Uh, it used to be known as God's own country. It was, it's one of the, was one of the most beautiful countries in the world to live in. Beautiful climate, beautiful scenery, lots of resources, first world status, uh, I was born there and raised there and educated there, so I have a little bit of a passion for it. This was we with me with my parents in our acre property, middle class family. Um, as you can see in those days, I did in fact have hair. Um, <laughs> and uh, it was a wonderful upbringing for me. I got the most amazing education because it was all British based. So that was back in those days, longer ago than I can remember. Now, Zimbabwe is a country that's blessed with a lot of resources. Uh, it's got a lot of diamonds. It is in, has, in fact, the largest reserves of platinum group metals in the world. So it's very strategic at the moment because these metals have a, have a lot of very uh, key uses in technology these days. A lot of base metals like manganese and copper. And it used to be, I think, the world's top tobacco producer, Burley Tobacco. I don't think that applies anymore and wonderful outdoor activities like game watching and sport and so on. So <clears throat> Zimbabwe more or less started as Rhodesia, named after Cecil John Rhodes, who was a British immigrant who arrived uh, in, in South Africa uh, many years uh, beforehand. And he was instrumental in establishing the diamond business in, in South Africa. Sorry, somebody's got their microphone on, please can they turn it off? Sorry guys, can you please mute yourselves? whoever's not muted. Anyway, he arrived and um, he was responsible for um, developing what was called the big hole in Kimberley. If ever you've seen that, it was the largest man-made hole in the world. And he had a vision of constructing a railway line for the, common, for the Commonwealth, for Britain, from Cape Town to Cairo, which actually never happened. But it started with um, the uh, passage of a pioneer column to what was called Fort Salisbury. So that was to what is now called Harare here. And that happened in 1890. It didn't go without a little bit of uh, uh, conflict along the way with the local tribes, but they established 
and a trading outpost there specifically to exploit gold that was believed to exist in the country. So basically, uh, uh, Rhodesia, as it was named, grew and grew. It became very prosperous, but there was this big issue that the country was governed by a white minority over a large black majority. And there was a lot of pressure on the white government, um, who, whose last uh, prime minister was Ian Smith, this guy here, uh, to in fact give everyone in the population one man, one vote. Uh, in those days, only whites could vote and there was job reservation for whites and a very, what I can best be described as a friendly form of apartheid. Um, it wasn't violent or vicious as it was in South Africa, but nonetheless it existed. And the British weren't happy about this. And there were discussions and negotiations between Ian Smith and Harold Wilson in the 60s to try and resolve this matter, which never actually happened. And in the end, Ian Smith decided, I've had enough of this. We're going to declare uh, the uni a unilateral declaration of independence, UDI, and we're going it alone. We're breaking away from Britain. And I can still remember being collected at school on the 11th of November, 1965 at 11 a.m. to go home and listen to Ian Smith make this announcement. We were all sent home from school early. And I think this is the same day as Remembrance Day, if I'm not wrong. Anyway, so from then, that point onwards, uh, Rhodesia was thrown into a, a real boiling pot. First of all, there was massive sanctions applied. There was oil sanctions applied. We couldn't get pet, uh, fuel and oil. Uh, to make refined petroleum products. Everything had to be done on the quiet by sanctions busting. And there was a tax from outside countries, namely Zambia and Mozambique um, from the north um, to essentially destabilize the country. We had bombs going off in shopping malls and particular farmers being attacked on their farms and, and driven out. So it was a very unstable, uncertain period until eventually in 1980, um, Smith capitulated and there was a transition to majority rule under one Robert Mugabe, uh, who'd been one of the leaders of one of the terrorist organizations that had been attacking the country. So from then onwards, they had majority rule. And what was interesting is things went quite well. Sorry about that. Things went quite well. But if this is, if you look here at the inflation rate, um, things went quite well in the 80s and 80s, and eventually things started getting un un unstable because Mugabe was no longer sticking to a lot of the what was agreed in the negotiated settlement, and the currency weakened dramatically. And in fact, you had uh, at one stage 100%, 150% inflation. Now, my brother in law experienced this. By the way, I had left the country by then, my parents were still there. This literally rendered them bankrupt. My father, who'd worked for the civil service all his life, had a good pension. My father-in-law worked on the railways, was in a very senior management position there, well off. Literally overnight, this made them bankrupt, and we had to support them from overseas to survive. But what this meant is, to give you an example, my brother-in-law went out to play a round of golf, and halfway around, they had a beer at the halfway house to have a break. They came back afterwards, Shah went into the pub afterwards for another beer. The price had doubled. So can you imagine trying to run a business and survive in a situation like that? And to combat this, the government started printing um, notes of higher denomination. And this is a hundred trillion dollar note, uh, which I, I've actually got a couple of these. They're totally valueless at the moment, but you can buy them as souvenirs for about five US dollars if you can get them. <laughs> but uh, this was quite remarkable because no one really knew how much this would buy. Um, at one stage, a million Zimbabwe dollars might have brought you a loaf of bread. Uh, it was just absolutely impossible to try and survive in that kind of environment. Now, as a result of all this and the weakening Zimbabwe dollar, uh, for which, by the way, there was a black market, the only way I could keep my parents going was uh, in a, in a, in a, through doing uh, so-called dirty deals with people there at, at ridiculous exchange rates. Zimbabwe relied on its power from a a hydroelectric scheme at Kariba. And this power was split 50-50 between itself and Zambia, and they were buying in power from South Africa as well to survive. Well, unfortunately, the power supply from South Africa dwindled. In fact, they, it should be nothing at this stage. And the availability of power from Kariba also declined to the extent that uh, now 
you they can only get about five hours a day of power and that's usually at night so this is what kariba looks like actually it's a beautiful resort to go to not great if you like uh, being on a boat on, on a massive lake and fishing and so on so of course um needless to say because there was no power they had to look for other sources to get money in and that hasn't really been resolved and to this day zimbabwe probably doesn't get more than about five hours of power a day now i'm telling you all this because there's a very similar pattern that's emerging in south africa at the moment and of course because of this because there was a lack of foreign currency because the zimbabwe dollar was so weak uh, they couldn't get the chemicals in the equipment to process water and I can tell you there were friends of mine that didn't have water for two to three weeks at a time and they had to go uh, to a friend's house several kilometers away to have a bath or to wash themselves or collect water so they could cook at home and everyone today has to boil their water in order to drink it so you know from, from a first world economy Zimbabwe is now definitely third world and guess what uh, at some stage Air Zimbabwe which is a very well respected airline with a number of good aircraft traveling to overseas destinations, had to cancel a lot of flights because it was basically bankrupt. And technically it's still bankrupt. Now the irony of this is that Air Rhodesia in previous days, heavily affected by sanctions, was still able to procure Boeing 707 aircraft, albeit secondhand, and run these to global destinations. So it just shows you the sheer incompetence of the government that took over. Anyway, Robert Mugabe eventually became too frail, and uh, he was um, eventually ousted by his major competitor, Ernest Mamangagwa, known as the Crocodile. Everybody thought, hallelujah, things are going to get better. Well, in actual fact, they didn't, because shortly after his inauguration, um, inflation lifted to 600%. So they had to start doing things like introducing the US dollar as a currency, change the way things were done. It's an absolute nightmare. And as it stands today, you can go to Zimbabwe and buy, buy products with pounds, dollars, uh, South African rand, whatever, um, but don't expect to get change. So let's just look at the ethnic groups of Zimbabwe. Now, the last recorded census was done in 1992, but this will give you a clue as to why Probus probably folded uh, in the past decades. So in those days, the total population was about 11 million people. I guess it's about 15 million. Huge amounts have left. There's a massive influx of people from Zimbabwe as illegal immigrants now living in South Africa and actually working here. If you go to most restaurants, you'll find that usually the waiter there is, is a Zimbabwean. So you can see that there were only in 1992, 80,000 whites. I'm guessing it's probably down to about 50,000 now, if that spread around the country, um, <clears throat> probably more focused on just trying to survive, um, doing other things, but it's not a huge base load for um, establishing Probus clubs. Now, as some of you are probably saying, okay, but look at the, the large African population. Why, you know, why can't they start contributing coming in? Well, we'll talk about that at the end of my presentation. Okay, so Zimbabwe is still a great place to visit if you've got US dollars. If you're a visitor and you go to the right destinations, fantastic tourist opportunities on Kariba. Fishing is brilliant. A lot of good game to be seen at the game parks. Uh, go and see Victoria Falls. I don't know how many of you have been there. It's a wonderful place to visit if you want to experience real Africa. Um, great hotel there, Victoria Falls Hotel, Old Colonial Hotel. Golf is brilliant. And again, good view from Victoria Falls. So there are, that's Zimbab the Zimbabwe situation and possibly why Probus doesn't exist there any longer. So let's move on to South Africa. So South Africa was basically discovered in 1488 by a Portuguese um, mar mariner called Bartholomew Dias, who'd been tasked with trying to find a trade route to Asia to try and trade spices with Indonesia. The Dutch arrived in 1652 when one Jan van Riebeck landed, very much with the same objective of trying to establish trade with Asia. And then in 1820, the arrival of British immigrants took place. And from that on, point onwards, there was a lot of strife between the three main groups, the Dutch, the British, and the local tribes. So the British took on the Zulu faction, 
in in the in the um, what was um, used to be called Natal. The British had fights against the Boers, who were basically the uh, the the Dutch people that had moved in, and it was just basically uh, a lot of fighting and and conflict. And there were other immigrants came in as well. Um, there was a large influx of Indians into Natal on the east coast. It's now called KwaZulu Natal, um, mainly to go and work on the sugar cane fields. And I believe that this is still the largest Indian community outside of India to this day. At least that's what Mr. Google tells me. So uh, Mahatma Gandhi spent some time there as a lawyer. And a lot of Malays were introduced into South Africa in the Cape area in the south. Uh, to basically introduce the religion, but also as slave labor in those days. So we're a pretty multi-ethnic country at this stage. Anyway, between 1910 and 1960, uh, the Union of South Africa was formed, which was basically a joint venture, if you will, between the Dutch and the British. And they had various leaders uh, during that time. And most of you probably heard of apartheid. Well, that was introduced by one HF Favort, who was the prime minister at the time, under what was called the Group Areas Act. And this was a very, very harsh form of discrimination. Unlike what happened in Rhodesia, there was a lot of harsh punishment for people who didn't conform. Every black and non-white had to carry what was called a pass. It was a bit like a passport. And they had to produce that on demand. They could only live in certain areas of South Africa and were allowed to come and work in the predominantly white areas, provided they had a pass. If they didn't have a pass, they were immediately arrested and probably punished. There was strict segregation for all facilities, whether it was toilets or buses or schools or beaches between whites and blacks. And you can see here, it says here, beach and sea for whites only in that direction. And there were facilities for blacks, but they were obviously not of the same standard. So it was very harsh, created a lot of ill feeling, probably quite rightfully so. And of course, one of the people who was responsible to trying to change all this was one Nelson Mandela, who was a lawyer, who was very, very active in the early 60s. And of course, was the lead, one of the main leaders of the ANC um, in those days. And because he refused to denounce violence as a way of effecting change, in other words, giving one man one vote uh, to the black people of South Africa, as had happened in Zimbabwe, he was arrested and sent and, and a lot, uh, with a lot of other um, of his colleagues to Robben Island in South Africa. And this is a view of Robben Island outside Cape Town here. This is Cape Town here. And you can take a boat across and to this day, you can visit the museum and actually see the cell where Nelson Mandela was incarcerated. It's actually a very interesting trip to do. So from that point onwards for about 30 years, there were periods of extreme instability in the country. There was a lot of police brutality against any black uprising. There were two in particular. There was Sharpeville in 1960 and the Soweto riots in 1976, where the police inflicted huge injury and, and death to black protesters. And this to this day is still is a, is a wound that uh, just simply won't go away with the black people and quite understandably so. There were strict sanctions against South Africa. And where in fact the country got hit hardest was on the sporting field because South Africa was passionate about rugby and they wanted to play test rugby against England and New Zealand. And there was actually a New Zealand tour. In, I think it was in the, um, in the 80s that had to be called off because there was just so many protests and so many interruptions. And this in the end um, resulted in the then uh, president of Zimbabwe, F.W. de Klerk, realizing that there was no way forward unless essentially the country was opened up and the ANC unbanned, a famous announcement that he made in parliament in 1990 and the release of Nelson Mandela. And in 1994, after a bit of a rocky road, uh, Mandela became president. But to give him his due, this whole transition was done relatively peacefully. There was a huge amount of bottled up unhappiness amongst the black population. And it was feared that they would literally um, unleash some violence on the whole of the white community. And unfortunately through Mandela's skill and, and integrity that was avoided. So he became a president. This was actually at his inauguration and both he and F.W. de Klerk were awarded the Nobel Peace Prize. 
as you can see from this picture here. So from the very harsh white national party between, that led between 1948 and 1994, where we had apartheid, transition took place to the African National Congress, which today is the leader of this country. So there we had Nelson Mandela, and for a, a happy five years under his leadership, the country did very, very well. He, he was a man incredibly intelligent, and I think he led us exceptionally well. He only did one five-year term though. I think he was starting to age a bit, but maybe he could also see some stor storm clouds gathering and didn't want to be part of that. So he was succeeded by his vice president at the time, a man called Thabo and Becky, who was quite good, um, but he, he initiated a few things that had started uh, <clears throat> which were the early stages of the damage that's, that's, that we're seeing to this day. And he was ousted on a technicality by unfortunately somebody who was, he was not a great guy. This was uh, Jacob Zuma, who took over for about nine years and did incredible harm to the country. Uh, a highly corrupt, evil individual who allowed a lot of corruption uh, and, and a lot of inefficiencies to creep in to all the state-owned enterprises, all the, 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 the um, facilities that are required to run the country. And there is a big elephant in the room um, and has been for the last five years or so, this thing called state capture, where he got into bed with three nefarious Indian businessmen called the Gupta brothers, who were allowed to basically run riot in the terms of way uh, goods were supplied, tenders awarded with huge rake-offs for them and Zuma's accomplishments, accomplices and probably Zuma himself. It was a massive, massive issue. These three guys are now apparently languishing in jail in Dubai, waiting extradition to South Africa for prosecution. So the biggest state entity that suffered as a result of all this was the Electricity Supply Authority, ESCOM. Now you can see where we're going here. Remember Zisa in Zimbabwe couldn't supply enough country, power for the country. And guess what? We have the same situation now. A lot of our coal-fired power stations, fired power stations, have run into a decrepit state of repair because they wasn't, weren't properly maintained during the Zuma years in order just to keep the power supply going to the country. Huge, huge corruption with the supply of coal. We have a situation now where high quality coal destination for our power stations is being diverted and substituted with low quality coal and rocks before it's delivered to the power station which is causing multitude of breakdowns to our power stations. That good quality coal is exported, obviously at a huge profit to a lot of corrupt players. Don't look too much into this graph in terms of the components of it, just look at the height. This shows the amount of power that's been lost to the grid, the overall supply capability of the country. And you can see it's just going up and up and up. And actually in the last four years, it's got much worse. And the future shows that the loss of power to the grid has escalated rapidly in recent years, is going to continue to rise. This is having huge ructions to our business, our economy, and the morale of the country. Currently now, we're probably losing about 10 hours a day of power. So can you imagine trying to run a small business when your power is continually going off? And it's, it's just unbelievable. In 2018, eventually we got rid of Zuma and we had Cyril Ramaphosa come in, who's our current president. He's just been elected for his second term. And everybody hoped this would be the new dawn. He would fix this. He was a respectable businessman. And it was looking encouraging at one stage where he appointed who, who seemed to be a very competent um, businessman, a corporate man, Andre De Reiter, uh, who was appointed. And he, Andre de Reiter's just finished a three-year term, and I'll tell you what happened there shortly. But he was actually a colleague of mine. I used to work for this company, Sassel. Amazing guy, got a lot of business sense, and everybody felt that he could fix this problem of, of ESCOM and get us back onto even keel again. Well, unfortunately, he wasn't able to do this. This graph shows what is called the energy availability factor. 
Now, what that means is it's the percentage of plant that's operating properly and supplying power. Now, in any kind of plant, whether it's a petrochemical plant, an oil refinery, or a power generator, you need to maintain it from time to time. You have to shut it down. And normally, the operating level should be around 85%. 15% of that time, that unit is down for repairs. But guess what? Because we've had so many problems with corruption and believe it or not, sabotage, for some reason, there are people sabotaging these plants, causing a sudden shutdown. Our energy availability factor is running at around 50% down here. So in other words, instead of getting typically 35 to 40,000 uh, megawatts uh, of power, we're only getting about 20,000. So that means you're only going to get power for half of the day. So this is a, having a huge impact on the way things are run. This is a typical site outside shops now in shopping areas. This is in, in just down the road from where I live. I'm going to try and play this video and you can hear the sound of, of what it's like with a generator. There you are. So when you go shopping, that's typically the kind of thing you'll hear now when there's, when there's load shedding, blackouts basically. So towards the end of last year, it was discovered that the CEO was now suffering, uh, uh, suffering from a lot of attempts on his life. He had to walk around with a bodyguard. He had to have security at his home. And at one stage, he actually was poisoned. He drank a cup of coffee where somebody slipped in some cyanide and he had to be rushed off to hospital. And at that stage, he said, I've had enough, I'm resigning. And that duly happened. He was supposed to work three months of his notice. Um, and uh, that also didn't happen because he actually gave an interview um, on television where he shared the fact that a lot of very senior ministers in government and politicians were involved in the whole sabotage of ESCOM and the whole business of corruption and then ESCOM was just a feeding drop for these guys. Well, of course, this upset the ruling party tremendously, and he was Saruman, uh, then basically dismissed immediately on the spot, and to this day, I think he's fearing for his life. And as it stands at the moment, there is no CEO in charge of the entity, and to be quite honest, there's not a lot of optimism that this is going to be turned around within the next few years. So let's move on to the next exciting thing that we're faced with. This is our Minister of Police, a particularly um, evil character by the name of Becky Chelly, um, who doesn't really seem to be concerned with focusing on the real problem. In our population of 60 odd million, we are privileged to 83 murders and 138 reported rapes a day. And I say reported rapes. It's probably a lot more than that, but then it just don't get reported to the police. And this is escalating, it's going up and up and nothing is being done about it. Huge gender-based violence that isn't being addressed. And so people are now starting living more and more in fear of their lives. I can tell you that I live um, about a 45 minute drive out of Cape Town. I have to drive along a particularly dangerous freeway to get into town. There are often reports of rocks and stones being thrown at cars and, and people's, uh, people also running over nails and whatever in the road having punctures, pulling over and being attacked. You definitely do not want to be driving on that road after dark. So that's not safe either. And hey, guess what? South African Airways is totally, totally bankrupt. This 20 years ago was a world-class airline flying to a multitude of different destinations. There were at least 35 aircraft, wide body jets, you name it. Now, they are down to just five small planes flying within South Africa and regionally and looking for a buyer of what is essentially a bankrupt business that's been bailed out of the government for far too long. There are a lot of municipalities, mainly in outlying areas, that are now experiencing flowing sewerage in the streets, simply because there's no money or no commitment to fix aging sewage treatment plants. There is fears of contaminated water now in a lot of areas. In fact, I live in one of the better areas of South Africa where things are far better run. 
But even then, I don't trust the water uh, treatment facilities and I boil all my drinking water. Potholes, this is, South Africa is becoming famous for potholes. Potholes just aren't, aren't simply repaired and we have a lot of jokes about potholes, about the size of them and what they can do to your, the wheels of your cars if you are unfortunate to run over them. There's just no money. Now, a lot of this is happening in the nine provinces of South Africa. There are, are nine provinces, eight are governed by the ANC and actually to a large extent, all these problems that we're seeing are taking place in these nine provinces. The Western Cape is a bit different. It's governed by a different party that's a lot more uh, competent, uh, less corruption, far less corruption, a lot more efficient. And to a large extent, we don't have such large problems as they do further to the north. So guess what? Everybody's gravitating, who can do, is gravitating towards the Western Cape. And it's a lovely uh, tourist destination. Some of you have probably been there. This is Table Mountain here, um, and this is False Bay on the other side of the peninsula. Uh, just beautiful scenery, beautiful facilities, and a wonderful place to visit. And again, if you come here as a tourist, uh, you will experience the uh, luxury of load shedding and some of the challenges that we have, but it, you're not going to really experience what life is really like on an ongoing basis under this kind of situation. Now, yes, everything is great, but if you drive past <coughs> one of the black townships called Kailicha, this is what you'll see. A large number of informal settlements of, of these shacks, people coming from up north in the hope of finding work because the employment opportunities here are far greater uh, than they are up north. And in fact, this is our unemployment rate over the years in percentage. It's running round about now about 35, 36%. So generally it's 35 to 36%. But what's even more worrying is that our youth from say school to university leaving age to about 35, it's much higher. It's actually about 65%. So you've got a lot of unhappy youngsters who can't get work um, looking to try and survive. So of course, crime is really on the increase now because people have to, to rob and burgle to survive. Just to give you an idea of what South Africa's industries are like, and I apologize for the poor quality of this graph, it's the best I could find. You can see there's been a change in the contribution to the economy between 1980 and 2018. Uh, mining used to contribute a lot towards South Africa's industry, particularly gold and precious metals. And you can see that that has shrunk a lot. Uh, I think South Africa has largely been mined out from gold. Uh, it's becoming a lot more expensive to get down to deeper depths to mine it. And unfortunately, manufacturing has also taken a dip. And this is where your employment opportunities are. And because manufacturing's really been uh, shrinking, so have job opportunities. And in actual fact, it's reported today that our GDP shrank 1.3% um, in the last year. It's actually gone down. And a lot of this is because of this whole business of load shedding. Who wants to come and invest in a country where there's no reliability of power supply? And that's really what our problem is today, what we're faced with. Uh, which minerals are more important to our economy? Well, you can see gold still is. Platinum group metals are iron ore, other, and coal. Coal is very, very important. We're a large exporter of, of um, low ash coal. So very, very important. This is our gold output. You can see gold um, output um, in, I'm not quite, it's just an index um, is decreasing. Um, so some of the other metals and minerals like coal and PGMs are starting to take over. Now, another factor that's affecting us is the RAND to the US dollar exchange rate and to in fact to any currency. Again, because of the deteriorating perception of the country around the world, the exchange rate is affected because people don't want to bring their money here because it's a risk to invest it. Can they get it out again? Is it going to be worth more? And in this graph here, for in 2016, the rand collapsed to 16 rand to the US dollar. Can you see in 1980, in 1984, it was on parity. In fact, it used to be stronger than the US dollar. And it went up to 16. Today, because of worsening situations, it's 18, it's over 18 to the US dollar. So anybody in South Africa wanting to travel overseas, 
finds it very, very expensive now. And of course, anybody from overseas wanting to come here will find it incredibly cheap. So that encourages tourism a lot. But if you want to import something that has to be paid for in US dollars or any other currency, it's going to cost you a lot more. So this isn't helping us much either. But it's still a great country to come and visit. And to be honest, a great country to come and live, to live in if you like the simple things in life and you can accept the challenges of load shedding, protecting yourself from higher crime. Um, South Africans love a barbecue. We call it a braai place or braai. Spend a lot of time cooking meat outdoors, going to places. Fantastic um, <coughs> countryside, wine estates here are very good. Um, wonderful wine and you can travel around and, and taste wine and buy it very, very, very cheaply. Uh, sport is a very popular sport. Rugby, rugby is a very popular sport. Um, and we spend a lot of time going to that and watching it. And of course, game viewing is fantastic as well. So still has a lot to offer. Just got to be a bit careful when you visit here. Okay, at last, what does this all mean for Probus? Okay, here we go. This is a graph of the status of our situation in South Africa. Sorry, apologize for that. Uh, in terms of clubs, we see a declining number of clubs over the last 10 years. Okay, our club members of, uh, numbers have shrunk from 95 to around about 70. And a lot of this is because of the circumstances we're seeing in the environment in South Africa at the moment. People's morale is very low. Uh, they're not really prepared to go out and make extra effort to do things. A lot of people have left, a lot have died, died off, and a lot of youngsters have left. In terms of our number of members, we've shrunk from 4,000 to around 2,600. Sorry to say, but that's the way it is. It goes with the closure of clubs. We had been trying to really try and restore things, but a lot of the remarks that I heard during our earlier meeting that clubs have got a lot of old members that are resistant to change and aren't prepared to step up and take on a role. In a lot of cases, many of them have done that already, results in this kind of trend. So I think what we've seen elsewhere in some other clubs around the world um, is no stranger to us and, and we're seeing that here. Now this is having an impact, starting to have an impact on the structure of our admin in the way South, uh, Southern Africa is run. So in the past, we had what's called the Probus Council of Southern Africa. And again, Southern Africa, still including Zimbabwe in terms of constitution that we have. And reporting into that were four uh, provincial associations. Remember I said there are nine provinces. So we had um, Gauteng South, which is around Johannesburg. We had KwaZulu-Natal, formerly Natal, which is around Durban. We have Probus Association of the Western Cape, which is in yellow, which I'm going to talk about now. And the Probus Association of the Garden Route, which is up the east coast um, of um, Eastern Province. And then there are a lot of clubs around the country, dotted around the country, that aren't under any kind of provincial association. So you can see this is what we have here at the moment, how they stack up. Now, the Probus Association of the Western Cape, over the last few years, we've been trying to work very hard to... to to grow clubs, uh, get membership going, and try and encourage this business of fellowship, doing things together, having intra-club functions, getting together and having a sports day or a quiz. Well, unfortunately, that hasn't been very successful. There's been a lot of apathy. And on top of that, we haven't been able to get quality people stepping up for succession planning on the management committee. There are basically two of us on the management committee that have been trying to drive things and run them forward for a while. I have been chairman of that committee now for three years. Um, I too am actually leaving the country in next year or so. So I'm not gonna be able to run it. And we realized because we cannot get people to step up, we're going to actually close it. And on 19th of April, we're having a special general meeting whereby clubs will, um, come together and we will take a vote to pro close Probus Association of the Western Cape. In essence, the Probus Association of KwaZulu-Natal isn't really functioning anyway. It's there on paper, but it's not doing anything. And there isn't even a management committee. And much the same applies to the Probus Association of the Garden Route. So really from an effectiveness point of view, only um, Gauteng South and ourselves have been active in trying to bring clubs together to do things. 
Now, what's going to happen after the closure of uh, the Western Cape is that it will be looked, the Probus Council of Southern Africa will look something like this. 59 clubs without any kind of association, and then um, PAGs, as we call it, with 12 provincial clubs. Now, what happens is every three years, the council management is cycled between the management committees of each of these associations. So when KwaZulu-Natal folded about two and a half years ago, we took it over. And um, PAGS is due to take it over from us in about a year's time. And they are saying they are also struggling to find people to step up and run this. And in all likelihood, in one to two years, they will also close, which means that the council is going to look something like this. And that will comprise probably two or three people running it as a secretariat, nothing more. In other words, no activity to try and draw clubs together and to do things, simply because there's no one there prepared to step up and do something. I don't have too much of a problem with that because the clubs that are surviving now, to be honest, don't need an association over them. They're strong enough to do their own things, run in a bubble and survive. I mean, my own club's a perfect example of that. So unfortunately, this is the way it's going to pan out. Um, the South African environment, I'm sorry to say, is, is, is partially responsible for this. People don't want to travel anymore. They, they find it risky. It's not safe. You certainly don't want to be traveling anywhere at night, any sort of distance, because you just don't quite know what you're going to meet up with. And unfortunately, that I believe is, is why we're sitting in this situation as, as we are today. Anyway, that's all, folks. Uh, oh, yes, by the way, this is a, an interesting question. The, the 2019 census of the population of South Africa, which was 55 million in those days, black 81%, white 8%, colored 8 Indian 2 People ask the question, why aren't there any blacks in Probus? Very interesting question. Now, one of the reasons for that is that the way membership is grown, the policy has been, you as a member have to, have to bring in new membership by inviting people you know. So, of course, most white people know whites, so they invite white people. Secondly, I don't know if the black population is amenable to the kinds of things that white Probus is doing. You know, there's a culture difference here. Plus, remember that before 1994, blacks weren't really in executive positions. It's only after 1994 that young, young executives starting to come in could take on executive positions and then get to the age where they could retire and be old enough to qualify for progress. So one could argue that maybe one should be looking to the black population to try and grow it. To be honest, I don't know how the older members of Probus would feel about that because it represents a major change. Some of you were mentioning how difficult it is to change from a men's club or a ladies only club to a mixed club because of this resistance to change. There could be that as well. But this is a very delicate question uh, and it's not something that's really being addressed at this point in time. But there you are, that's a, that's a thought I'd like to leave with all of you. Anyway, that's it. I hope I haven't bored you too much. It's been very much a whistle stop tour. But I thought I'd like to give you a real um, representative presentation of what South Africa is really like when you live here on the ground. Okay, thanks very much. I'm going to stop sharing and um, pass it back to you. Thank you, Nick. Very, very informative. Uh, any questions for Nick? See everybody is muted. Um, oh, we got it. Let's see if there's anything on the chat box. No. Okay. Okay. Good. Have I all shocked you? <laughs> <laughs> Am I allowed to say something, Leo, in Durban, Please. South Africa? Yes, hello, Leo. Uh, very basically, a lot of people don't realize the size of South Africa. If I quietly say from Cape Town to Johannesburg is a thousand miles, 
That's the same as if you were in London that's expecting exactly the same conditions in Rome. It doesn't happen. The other thing is, Nick, if I can pull you late, you talk to Ho Ting, which is fine, but everybody else knows this is the Transvaal. We're out of date. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, Leo, thank you. Thank you, Leo. Okay. Um... <coughs> Okay, there's nothing in the chat, just some comments. Uh, is there any other questions or comments that, on the general meeting anybody would like to make? One comment on the speaker from South Africa was, it was, I wasn't shocked. I was shocked by the depth of the problem. I knew South Africa had issues, but I was very shocked by it. So it was very enlightening. Thank you. Uh, by the way, the record, this has been recorded, as we're all aware, and uh, it should be up on our website uh, probably within the next two or three days once Peter and, uh, and Steve coordinate and figure out who's doing what to whom. So yeah, very interesting talk and very informative, and um, we can see why uh, the numbers uh, for our group uh, would, would be changing in South Africa and the Mm -hmm. can't really yeah i mean I, I, what i didn't say at the end is that you know history gives you an understanding of the future the one thing one can say about zimbabwe is what's happening in south africa has been an exact repetition of what happened in zimbabwe and you know having experienced the zimbabwe situation i mean you be absolutely blown away about how the economy how the economy works there uh, i mean i went there and changed the money on the black market um, and played a round of golf had two beers, lunch, and a caddy for 10 US dollars. Okay. Uh, it was just absolutely incredible how the econo economics work. But from what I experienced there, I could see that South Africa was going to hit exactly the same way. So I got a, a massive advance warning, and I'm talking about 20 years. So I was able to plan my life, preparing for what would happen in South Africa, hoping that I wouldn't have to leave one day. But actually, the situation's got so untenable now that I have to leave. But the, fortunately for me, because I, I knew of this and I could plan for it, I can afford to leave. Many people in Zimbabwe and certainly many people in South Africa just don't have the financial resources to exit the country. Good. Any other comments or questions? I'd like to ask, I'd like to ask Nick where he's going. <laughs> Well, believe it or not, uh, you Australians, you might have had me down there a lot earlier if it wasn't for a particular problem I had um, getting my wife's health approved. But um, I'm going to England and I'm going to the south of England to a little place called New Milton. In fact, I'm leaving on Sunday for a week to try and buy a home. Mm. So it's quite daunting. <laughs> mm. I wish you all the luck in the world, Dick. I'm going to need it. Thank you. You're very welcome. Come to Canada. We'll look after you. <laughs> <laughs> it's just it's just so damn cold. Yeah. Exactly. Well, exactly. Uh, what, what a lot of uh, people do is they, in fact, we have quite a few probians, the swallows. So they live in the UK in summer for six months and then come out here for six months and they own homes in both countries because property here for a foreigner is very, very cheap. So they do that. So I'm going to become a reverse swallow. <laughs> <laughs> well, good luck. thank you okay uh i noticed a comment from barry uh who's barry morgan who spent some time in uh, in ghana so familiar with some of the stuff you're talking about okay if uh, nothing else we'll do a wrap and i'd like to thank everybody for attending very informative meeting and uh, we will schedule something else we we're down to three uh, i think it's uh, three a year at this current time so probably near the end of the summer just the start of the fall we'll do this again and uh, certainly it's uh, it's a way of uh, keeping everybody in touch and uh, we talked about, uh, you know, twinning of clubs earlier. Uh, we've seen numerous people that are traveling, uh, catching up to uh, Probus clubs around the world. It was interesting uh, 
uh, Don Ross uh, when he uh, visited uh, Belgium and spent some time with the club there. And, uh, and I noticed as we were going through our meeting, uh, he's not a member of PG, but I'm sure uh, between Peter and I, he will be within the next couple of days. So take care, everybody, and uh, thank you very much. And we're looking forward to seeing you again. And don't forget, the recording will be on the website soon. Thank you. Take care. Bye, Bye now. everybody. Thanks. Bye now. Bye.